Hello and welcome. My name is Paula McAbee, and I'm the Advocacy Director and Counsel for Water Legacy. And we'd like to thank the University of Minnesota Extension. Um, their funding has contributed to our ability to bring these wonderful panelists together. And um, we're going to start out with a prayer. And Ricky Defoe, who is the Fond du Lac elder and also a sweat lodge keeper and a uh, a pipe carrier. He has worked as a language and curriculum specialist within the Fond du Lac Reservation Ojibwe Language Revitalization Program and serves on the Board of Water Legacy. He has co-chaired Duluth's Indigenous Commission, served on an ad hoc committee to ensure civilian oversight of law enforcement in Duluth, and co-chaired the Annie E. Casey Foundation's Oversight Committee to reduce racial disparities in juvenile detention. And Ricky also has had the experience of actually canoeing up to the PolyMet mine site and seeing what the natural resources are firsthand. And so Ricky, what I'm gonna do is ask you to offer a prayer and then um, Ricky's gonna talk. He could talk for hours, but he's being courteous and letting our other panelists talk <laughs> for about, about 10 minutes on just, or 15 minutes at the longest, Ricky, on the importance of water <laughs> and wild rice and fish to Anishinaabe culture and the difference in the world view that Anishinaabe people have about nature and the living beings there. So Ricky, if you want to test your microphone, I'll turn mine off. Welcome everybody. Oh, one more thing. Sorry. One more thing. Um, can you, am I audible? Yeah. yeah. Um, we have cards on the side. What we've done is ask the panelists to present their information first, and then we can answer questions, have a discussion about any of the issues related to sulfate, or if people want updates on what's going on on some of the policy issues. Put, feel free to put your questions on cards, or at the end, if you're brave, raise your hand and talk. But um, I'd like us to wait for the questions until the end so that we can all share the same body of knowledge first. And I'll be happy to answer questions about mining as well as our panelists as ans answering questions about the subjects of our t discussion today. Thank you. Bonjour, bonjour. Akoi. Asse ma ke a nishinabe. Apne nishinabe o gaganuna manito. Beje ka ikwe gipi gagwe jimid. Che gene anama e tawak sa ginawa ma anime ka ge ginawa gede nishinabe akiminan akino yo ma nungam gegete sa ungo nishinabe gaji na nagada windman gegete sa ingyo niji be matazig niji nishinabe debiku a in Dakota, Midash Cree, Midash Sinaboin, Akane in Gyo Nijibimatazig, Mjibwa Nishinabege ya Chikoma, Nashke Kujing, Gechi Ojibwe Gaming, Nishinabe Gaya Ginoa, Kakweji Mark Bejik, Manituema, Che we do kwagisa nishinabeg niji bimata zig chi kweako ishichi geyang kweako nindu manga e sa uma nungum miu ni be nigan bejik nin mi yangi da manito nishinabeg niji bimata zig o dayano a nivo gego chimi guchi in the mung de bishku bimata zi O gi jiga kae misogo gi spin gi gi de spin damen ga na kame gi zian ki da na na ga na windum ge get ki ga na windum ge na kame gi zian ga e ki che piten da ku che ninda e wen ge te anishna be wen ge te ge ken da su wen ga e Nungum ninga jaganashim, gegetisa ninga gagwejito che queco gikidoyan, o sa bangi gego ingi kendan. 
nebe minuan manomen nungum nigal chagana sim sweni machin manito so anamikage welcome everybody here we are in uh, ojibwe country but before we go claim the lands and things we always acknowledge those other nations that were here before us the great dakota nation the Sinabo and the Cree, other nations that come through um, here and their ancestors are here. They always talk about the topsoil being indigenous peoples, literally and figuratively. So we want to acknowledge those other nations that come through these lands before. We talk about the importance of relationship to one another and we want to ask those money to in in a society that's despiritualized, to be spiritual in thought, to guide us in our words and our actions and in and, um, and our feelings, to to so that we can have life for those generations to come. So <clears throat> we have a lot to be grateful for. Not only the Great Sea of the Ojibwe, the Ojibwe Nation is all around. We know that the line of demarcation cuts right straight through the Ojibwe Nation. So we ask those money through in these riverways to, to have pity on us as a people because we've, we do not own these lands. We do not own these waterways, but we're told by the old ones to take care of them. That's a big task in a society we've got, so we want to sound out and, and reach for the ones that are unseen, the spiritual ones, and the, uh, so we know about that balance with um, the physical and the spiritual. So again, we thank the Manito, those, the great mystery for the moment we got, the time we come together here. We want to thank each of you for taking time out of your day and your lives for coming here to hear the words that are going to be presented and the respect that you're showing now. So we thank the mysteries for this moment. I'm uh, going to smooth right into or transition or segue, as they say, in the university settings to, I always ask those ones, and who are the old ones, the, those ones, the, the ancestors and things, the ones that are in our worldview, we talk about the great-grandparents, the grandparents, the parents are three generations that come before us, and they have knowledge and teachings, oral traditions that are given to us. We're them in the middle. So then we try to teach our children some things that went wrong, some things that went right in the society that we've been born into. And we've been born into a very violent society, a racist society, xenophobic, homophobic, transphobic, a very racist, sexist world, a very um, addicted culture. Sometimes we don't like to hear those things, but we need to. So we center ourselves in this society. And as a center there, then we try to teach our children some things along the way. And they and then turn to the grandchildren and then the great-grandchildren. So those are the seven generations that we see as Ojibwe people, the importance of transfer of knowledge. Now, some things that we're going to know, we're not going to know all the answers, but we're going to know what we know today and what to tell the children. And what they then, we bring them along with us to these places at times so that they can be there with the grandparents, the great-grandparents, and they can say that they're a part of that. So the children then are raised in, in the struggle for life. So we think about those ways, a different way of seeing that world. We have, we talk about monomen, wild rice. All nations of people have creation stories. They're all true. <laughs> so we have ours, Ojibwe Nation people, Nishnabe people. Nishnabe, we were lowered here. We were put here. 
Nowhere in our oral tradition does it say we come across the Bering Strait. We migrated here through prophecy of the food that grows on water. So we come from the east, this direction. This is our oral tradition. This is part of um, the migration story, following the creation story. So those are the importance for us. We know that nature and culture are actual realities and that this anthropogenic, um, economically driven stock exchange and these other things that take place in the world, the economy, are an illusion, a way of seeing the world that we think that will bring us happiness and things. But we know from trial and error of chasing the American dream that it became a nightmare for us. So we see those things. So we don't want to go down that road again for our children. When we talk about monomen, we're also talking about the water that it grows on. And those things are very critical to life. In Ojibwe country, we endured much. We fought many battles. And we think about the ones and learn from those ones, the little victories that we can give to the children. Like we understand that these corporations in America look after themselves. They know that these corporations then form these think tanks. These think tanks then, well, they fund these think tanks. These, these think tanks then formulate policies that are favorable to business. And then those attorneys, corporate attorneys, then draft legislation from those policies that are favorable to, to their business. So then we come to the political action committees. They fund the politicians. The lobbyists then ensure that the politician stays bought. And then we know also that the, some of these corporate executives are appointed to these federal agencies and even state agencies that we know that, that they are entrusted to um, uphold or even dismantle those laws that are unfavorable to business. These are th some things that we've learned along the way in our struggles for sovereignty. We know that the importance of sovereignty for Ojibwe people is life and as a political entity. And this is the way that we as a commonality, as a common people, can come together to ensure victory for life. Because the current trajectory that we're going down is creating death and destruction. And we know that the importance of water in that. We've been socialized to in a root paradigm. As Ojibwe people, we understand. As Anishinaabe indigenous people, we know that this root paradigm involves dominion over all things. We've heard of that. I was raised on a reservation and traveled here to Duluth in the, raised as a Catholic. So I heard a lot about dominion over all things. And then we hear about a hierarchy of life, the great chain of being. And then we know that in America, the white man is at the top and the black man is at the bottom. Even much so that the white man is at the top and the white woman is below in a patriarchal society. So these things play out in our relationships with these institutions because everything is postulated from that view. And then we wonder, and we also know that a male transcendent God, and <clears throat> that's deep, deep stuff, cosmology stuff, but in a w philosophy and values and actions stem from that, that create these institutions. We know they're unsustainable. How can we sustain that when we see the chaos that's created in our environment, the storms, the winds, we see that. But then we do not 
think about that, even when we see the rock nation coming across the desert. We see the tracks like a mouse in the snow, but still we don't believe that the rocks are moving. And there's limitations to that, the way you see the world, that way we're socialized to believe. So I wanted to share a few of those things about thinking differently in a world, in a society, because everything, even though we have the, the experts, the, the playing field is not fair. So everything is, we find out is they can point the fingers at each other, it's not us, it's them, it's them, it's them, but the desired effect is in their interest. So, but there's beauty in the struggle. So when we meet fine people in that struggle, that's where the beauty is because it's through relationships and how we relate to our Mother Earth who is the source of life. So we should not be thinking of her as the resource. And um, <clears throat> so I want to leave it there. I think I had, uh, I don't want to do um, what uh, Paula has said, talk for a half hour, but I want to thank you for listening to uh, the words that I had to say. Thank you. Miigwech. Now, our, our next panelist is one of the fighters for life that Ricky Defoe was talking about, and that's Nancy Schultz, and her formal title is the Water Projects Coordinator for the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, but I have known Nancy through our work for the last 13 years, and Nancy's on the forefront of protecting the Fond du Lac Band water by providing modern and protective water quality standards. She's been at the forefront of um, making sure that the corporate interests that Ricky talked about and the agencies don't strip away the protection um, of our wild rice sulfate standard, and we finally did achieve um, water legacy, but really I will have to say this is the first leader um, achieve the protection of that standard so it will not be repealed. And uh, Nancy and I collaborated on a very innovative project to find the rights of tribal nations to object to permits that are upstream of them that could violate the water quality standards. And Nancy's been leading that important struggle which restores sovereignty as well as protecting wild rice and water. And so I'm introducing her to you as, yes, an expert in water quality and sulfate, but also as one of the heroes of protecting life. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm blushing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Actually, I was thinking about some of, of Ricky's words, and, and I was going to say maybe leveling the playing field is something that I'd like to think that I've had a hand in doing. At any rate, um, I was invited to come speak at this panel discussion tonight uh, to talk a little bit about wild rice and sulfate. I thought I was told not to talk about mining, so I took all the mining slides out. <laughs> but that's okay, because there's plenty to talk about besides that. Um, I've had the great honor of working for the Fond du Lac Band since 1997, hired fresh out of graduate school, um, and it has been just the most incredible opportunity for me to learn so much about uh, the Anishinaabe community that I serve, and to recognize that in, in myself, I feel very much aligned um, spiritually uh, and, and cosmologically with uh, the Anishinaabeg worldview as it comes to respecting all our relations, all of the living beings that we share this planet with. So I'll talk a little bit about what we have done at the Fond du Lac Reservation to establish our water quality standards program which has turned out to be more than just some kind of dry political regulatory framework, but actually the basis for the legal standing that we have relied upon to start making some of those differences that Paula alluded to. Not sure. Oh, there we go. Too fast. Are you doing it? There. Okay. So this is what it's all about today, Manolman. 
Zizania palustris, Zizania aquatica is another species that uh, that shares some of the waters in the in the Great Lakes Basin. Used to be distributed widely across the continental United States, pretty much everywhere east of the Rockies, until the great pioneer migration that decided that we were going to tame the world and institute uh, row crop and industrial agriculture and we were going to build cities and develop and essentially change the landscape and the waterways and the hydrology and the quality of the environment to the extent that it really only now still exists in Minnesota, in northern Wisconsin, a little bit in, Wis in Michigan where tribes are working on restoration actively. And then up in Canada, it's still thriving pretty well in Canada, subject to all kinds of environmental stressors, including excess sulfate loading. This area where it grows naturally, the ambient water quality, ambient water chemistry is naturally very low in sulfate. And so it has adapted to, to living and growing in that kind of an environment. Other way. So as part of our water quality standards program, we developed um, standards that have been approved by EPA Region 5 back in 2001. Just like states do, we have to go through triennial reviews and revisions on a periodic basis. We have to make sure that we are taking advantage of all of the data that we ourselves have collected, any ongoing research that is relevant, um, anything that can inform either the, the updating or revision or changing of standards we are supposed to take into account. And, some of you may recall that about 10 years ago, this was a hot political subject. The state of Minnesota um, was essentially going to take a few years to study the problem and then come out with a new sulfate standard because industry and the permitted, the regulated community was convinced that the 10 parts per million sulfate standard was old science, it couldn't possibly be right, and there was no way that they were going to let themselves be forced to install expensive technology to meet a standard that had no scientific basis. But before that ever happened, the band had already instituted our own water quality standards. Our 10 parts per million sulfate standard had also been approved by EPA based on that same old, outdated John Moyle science from the 1940s and 50s. Turns out it was actually pretty darn good science. Mm -hmm. But we had been instituting a really comprehensive water quality monitoring program for all of the years since um, I started. And it included measuring sulfate in our wild rice water bodies, along with other important uh, water quality parameters, physical, chemical, biological. And what we found over um, nearly 25 years of active monitoring and hundreds and hundreds of water quality samples on each of our wild rice waters on the reservation, we're always in compliance. We don't have any external sources of sulfate being discharged or loaded to our waterways. And again, our, we're dealing with other impacts, hydrologic impacts that, that happened 100 years ago when this area was heavily ditched, again, to try to accommodate agriculture. But sulfate is a standard that we are able to demonstrate complete and total compliance with. Um, as the state was going through its research program and thinking about developing a, a revised water quality standard for wild rice, we were also going through a triennial review process. And in addition to the ongoing research, our own monitoring, we had actually been funding a fair amount of research into Monoman prior to the state's research program starting. Um, just throw this graph in to, sh to demonstrate that at, at the time that this graph was made, all of the water bodies um, identified by their, their code numbers down below, all of the reservation wild rice waters always, always meet our sulfate standard of 10 parts per million. And that has continued today with additional years of research. So like I said, we have supported research into basic ecology, understanding some of the mechanisms behind the traditional knowledge associated with monoman, things like how it is 
exhibits this interannual variability. Um, things like how important the hydrology is, things like how important the other associated communities, the birds that feast upon the rice worms, the muskrat that dig up the food piles and disturb the, the seed beds, et cetera. It's been an amazing journey for me to, to look at my practices as a trained scientist and think about what the community has tried to share with me and teach me about what they already knew about Minoan before I arrived. But we also saw the writing on the wall when it came to sulfate and approached some of the scientists here at UMD. Um, some of you may recognize John Pastor, who's uh, since retired, um, an emeritus professor, but uh, some of his colleagues have continued this body of research. So um, I'm looking at you, Nate. There's others in the room who have continued to keep this research alive. And we have done what we can to help support it, sometimes with direct funding, sometimes with finding some EPA money, sometimes advising the Minnesota Sea Grant um, board that they should fund a really cool research project uh, into wild rice ecology and sulfate impacts. At any rate, these tanks, these mesocosms, have been yielding <coughs> incredible scientific results for, I want to say, about 14, 15 years now. And at the time that we were going through our rule revision process and the state was going through its rule revision process, we looked at the same body of data and concluded that the science supports maintaining the 10 parts per million sulfate standard. And it was along multiple lines of evidence. There were germination studies that showed differences in the viability and germination rates of seeds exposed to varying concentrations of first sulfate and then sulfide, maintaining those anaerobic conditions. And then additional hydroponics experiments demonstrating that excess sulfide uh, caused impacts to root and shoot biomass, even in the short term. Um, and those were, again, like two-week, three-week long tests. For me, these mesocosms have yielded incredible information because they're the closest we can come to mimicking the real world. Um, we have supported this research. We've provided sediments. We've provided seeds. We've been engaged with the researchers over the years, but we would never allow experimentation to happen on a natural wild rice lake in, on the reservation. Um, adding a known pollutant, even in a controlled fashion, that was never going to happen on the reservation. So this is the next best thing. You can control essentially all of the variables you want to, except for the ones you want to study and manipulate. And so these mesocosms were established to show the effect of loading excess sulfate at different concentrations over multiple growing seasons. And what we have learned didn't just happen in the first year or two. It happened over um, a number of growing seasons. First, the highest concentration sulfate tanks went extinct. I think it only took about two years, maybe three years. Um, but there was this visible hydrogen sulfide plaque, that black uh, covering on the roots of plants that were exposed to higher sulfate. Sulfate, when it's in an oxidized condition, is not toxic. But when it gets down into the roots where there is no oxygen, it is reduced to sulfide. And that sulfide compound is what is causing the toxicity at different unique parts of the growing cycle. And here's some early data from amongst the first few years of the state's uh, research program. But it, it shows those clear declines in viability, both in, in seedlings emerging and um, seedling survival. Those are just some of the metrics that they were looking at. But you can see that at different treatments, yeah, I thought I had a pointer, at the 300 parts per million, like I said, within the first couple of years, those tanks were gone. The populations were extinct. A few more years down the road, the 150 parts per million treatment tanks went extinct, gone. And it's just been in the last year or two, the last couple of seasons, that the 100 parts per million tanks are going extinct. That really 
reinforces the idea that this is a cumulative impact. It is not that sulfate is directly toxic to wild rice plants. It's just the, the confluence of biogeochemical reactions that happen when you pour sulfate into a system that has not naturally got a lot of sulfate into it, and you see effects in species that have been adapted to grow in a place that doesn't have a lot of sulfate. The other interesting things that we've been learning since these experiments have been going on for years and years is that when you stop loading sulfate, it recovers. Those 300 parts per million tanks, they stopped loading sulfate to those tanks and the existing seed bank in the sediments of those tanks was enough to jumpstart a new population or a reemergent, resurgent population. Some of the other po um, hypotheses having to do with uh, iron being kind of a mitigating factor or dissolved organic carbon having something to do with kind of buffering the uh, effect of, of uh, sulfide toxicity. That was kind of at the gist of what the MPCA was proposing when they came up with that equation-based approach for water quality standards some years ago. The ongoing research uh, that Nate and, and Sophie LaFon Hudson and a whole parade of grad students and undergraduate students have shown that it doesn't work. It is not protective. So as you can see, the, the working hypothesis that, uh, that has been operational now for some years seems to be really borne out, that, that excess sulfide has an effect and an impact and it's an adverse effect or impact at various points in the growing cycle. It can inhibit germination. It can reduce the vigor of early seedlings. It can reduce the biomass that a, that a plant produces during a growing season. And then uh, at the end of the growing season, it can um, absolutely reduce seed production and, and reproduction, meaning that each subsequent year, you've got less and less of new seeds to start with. When we were uh, doing our triennial review of our water quality standards, in addition to pointing to all of that research that had been going on, in addition to pointing to our own monitoring data on our, our reservation wild rice lakes, we also decided that this had become such a politically charged topic that we were constantly seeking new ways of communicating the important relationship between the Ojibwe people and Monoman. And so we worked with some folks from right here at the med school and Minnesota Department of Health, and we developed a health impact assessment that essentially helped us communicate in a really broad and comprehensive way how important Monoman is to the health of the Ojibwe people. Not just from a nutritional standpoint, although it is a superfood, um, it has, it's very high in protein, low glycemic content, full of vitamins and fiber, et cetera, et cetera. It's a first food that is fed to babies. It is a last food that is offered to someone who has passed on in celebration of their life. Um, but it isn't just about the nutrition. It's about that seven generations connection, about the language and the activity and the knowledge that is passed from generations before through this generation to generations hence, that all revolves around Monoman and the actions um, and the activities around Monoman harvesting and stewardship of Monoman. And of course, protecting Nibi water, water quality so that it can continue to thrive. We talked a lot in that, um, in that study about how this represents a really cornerstone part of our food sovereignty, the ability to continue to protect, practice traditional life ways, to take advantage of the bountiful offerings of this world in this particular place, and, uh, and how it's important for tribal members and non-tribal harvesters like myself to continue to be able to harvest feed themselves, feed their families, and share it. I love to be able to share it with people who have never had real wild rice. We also did an economic impacts analysis. 
um, that demonstrated the importance of being able to harvest naturally growing wild rice to the tribal economy, to the state's economy. And we ran through several different scenarios about what it would mean with regards to, say, increased health care costs or uh, loss of income if there was less monoman around to harvest in future generations. And it actually turned out to be um, quite a bit more significant than I think anybody expected when we were going through this exercise. Um, it's, it's not the be all and end all of Minnesota's economy. I'm not trying to misrepresent it, but it is a significant <clears throat> element of the states and tribal economies. So I'm just going to wrap this up. What I have learned over the years, um, working in the capacity that I've had, is that sulfate is a bad actor on a, on a number of levels, at least with regards to the high quality aquatic ecosystems that we have in this part of the world. It uh, has obvious impacts on wild rice. It increases the methylation of mercury when there is naturally low sulfate systems and you pour sulfate into them, the microbial community that actively reduces sulfur to be able to, um, to generate its energy, its byproduct is methylmercury. And so that contributes to the, to the other problem that I've been working on for the entirety of my career, mercury and fish. It contributes to observed aquatic toxicity in aquatic um, communities like benthic invertebrates. It is a component of observed um, and um, for water bodies that have been deemed impaired for aquatic life use, it is a factor. It can contribute to eutrophication and harmful algal blooms by disrupting the phosphorus cycle and releasing more phosphorus from the sediments if it's bound there. And so you get this endless loop of internal phosphorus cycling that can cause harmful algal blooms. And for those of you that were paying attention, there wasn't a whole lot of, of um, publicity around this, but when the harbor corrosion issue reared its head about eight or 10 years ago and people were trying to figure out why all the sheet piling down on the harbor has all these nodules on it and it seems to be corroding at a much faster rate than would have been anticipated. The research that was done to look at the microbes that were living in those nodules, again, it's another, it's another sulfate group of, of, um, of bacteria. So again, it's not the only thing causing problems in our aquatic environments, but it sure keeps turning up in a lot of different places. And to me, there are multiple reasons for why we should be looking to control and treat excess sulfate loading to our water bodies up here. I thank you very much. And um, we're going to now have Dr. Kara Santelli give us a presentation. Um, Kara has a, a bachelor in geology from the University of Wisconsin Madison and a PhD in marine geomicrobiology geomicro from the MIT WHOI Joint Program in Oceanography. And she, Kara has been working in the laboratory on sulfate and on wild rice. And I think we also, we want to take a minute to say how much we appreciate the fact that the University of Minnesota in Duluth has really put a lot of energy in a lot of science into figuring out how to protect water quality and how to protect wild rice. So go ahead, Kara. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. All right. So... Um, I'm really, really pleased to be here. I'm really grateful to be here, especially with the people here um, who are presenting. It was, it's quite an honor to be presenting with all of these people. Um, and so today I'm gonna be talking largely about a research project that we started several years ago, and Nancy was there from the very inception. Um, and we've been given an Ojibwe name for this project, and you may have heard Ricky actually say this name, this, these words many, many times. Kawaegida, na na gadawindam and manomen, or psin in Dakota languages. And, and really the heart of that is, first we must consider manomen. 
we have to consider wild rice first. So that is the sort of centering piece for everything we do in our, in our research. Um, and I want to acknowledge that I play a very small part in this project, really, truly. There are so many important people on this project, and everyone has a very important contributing role. Um, and this is actually, I realized when I looked at this list, this is a list of all of our formal collaborators on this project. And the people's names that you see in red are, are native collaborators, um, and including those who represent tribal organizations or the tribes directly. Um, and I think one of the things that really point, stands out to me when, when we look at this list of people is um, the opportunity to really learn and co-produce knowledge and grow with our tribal partners. And, I don't know how familiar many of you are with university researchers and, and how we are often trained to do our science, um, but we are often not trained how to work directly with communities. Um, this has been a really transformative project for me as a scientist, as a scholar, as a educator, and really as a person who values community and values working with people and, and learning from people. Um, and it's actually really changed the way I actually do my science. Um, and I think everyone, I, I would imagine that every researcher on this, uh, on this project would, would feel similarly about this project. Um, and so Nancy set me up really, really nicely to start talking about some of the things that we started to think about with our project and how we first started pursuing a project like this. So this started in 2018. And this was about the time that Nancy um, and Fondu Lack, as well as you know, at John Pastor, Nate Johnson, Chanlin Chun, who's here, um, and Sophie Lafon, Hudson, and others were producing all of this amazing science thinking about you know, the role of sulfate and the impacts of sulfate on wild rice. And so Nancy alluded to all this. She already talked about all of this and, and the, um, what, what the tribes already knew and what we were discovering, really discovering much later as, as Western scientists, um, that sulfate, yes, sulfate does have an impact on wild rice. And so um, I found this nice diagram as Nancy was talking about it. Um, and it made me realize, oh wait, maybe here. Okay, so um, sulfate, right, in, when it enters, so the, the stream bed or the lake bed where wild rice is growing, it gets transformed. It gets converted by bacteria that are naturally there. These are natural bacteria. There's nothing harmful about them. This is a natural process. They convert that sulfate um, to sulfide, right? And the prevailing theory that Nancy talked about was that you know if you have iron in in solution which we have lots of iron here in northern Minnesota um, you know that that would combine with the sulfide and precipitate a solid mineral strip out the sulfide you know sort of neutralize the sulfide in some sort of way um, but there's also the countering effect that if you have a lot of organic carbon, so if you're in a wetland or a peatland or something like that, where there's just naturally a lot of organic carbon, those bacteria would really thrive and start to produce more sulfide. And so when we first started working on this project, we were thinking about, okay, my skill set as a biogeochemist was thinking about okay, but there's other forms of sulfur that we need to think about. There's other reactions, chemical reactions happening in the, in the subsurface that we really need to think about. And I was uh, a good colleague of mine, uh, Crystal Ng, who's, who's one of the leads on the project. She's a groundwater hydrogeologist, so she was thinking about, okay, where is, you know, it, what are the interactions between groundwater and surface water, and how is that influencing what's happening to wild rice? And so we had, had this great idea formed in our minds about what we wanted to work on and how we were going to truly work with tribes on, on this project. And when we started, um, we developed a, a pre-proposal and we started to reach out to people we knew. Nancy was one of them. And, it, and basically they said, you know, We've been working on sulfate, and yes, it's important. 
And if you want to work with tribes, you need to really step back and approach this very, very differently for many reasons. We had not consulted tribes before we actually started becoming interested in this work and thinking about these ideas. And we were so focused on this one topic because as Western scientists, we're so siloed in our disciplines. I viewed, before this project, I, I tell everyone, I'm an interdisciplinary scientist. I think about the biology, the chemistry, the geology, the environment, you know. And what this project taught me is that I'm still a really siloed scientist. <laughs> Um, even though my work might touch on those things, I was not thinking about what indigenous knowledge holders already knew about, about wild rice and these ecosystems and the connections to, you know, the other animals and to insects and to humans, right? And so it was really um, a humbling experience as a, at the time, a fairly junior scientist being told, no, no, you go back and rethink this and you do this again. And so we were fortunate enough to have people who somehow, I'm not sure how, trusted us that we would take a step back and we would honor those requests to listen to the tribes, to, to really listen to, to people who know so much more about the systems that we wanted to study. And so one of the things that, oh, I don't know if it's not going forward. Thank you. So one of the things that our, our partners, when they weren't our partners at the time, but we just listened to many, many people and, and went around the state, went to Wisconsin and started listening. And, you know, they had concerns beyond sulfate, right? They they were concerned about water levels, how we control water levels. They're concerned about climate change um, and you know, invasive species. And these are things they already knew about, um, but they wanted to work with scientists who really f understood and felt the same values that um, the indigenous knowledge holders felt. And so we spent a lot of time relationship building. Um, a good year or so before we actually started going in the field with any one of with any of our partners um, and so we've learned a lot through that process we've made mistakes we we do continue to make mistakes in this project um, but we are learning all the time and we try to be accountable to the best we can and to actually partner with our with our partners. Um, and so we came up with this idea of how, we, how would we center Monoman and what are the different factors that we hear from indigenous knowledge holders as well as from our Western science framework and how can we um, work on all of these different factors um, that affect, you know, Monoman ecosystems and that could be plants and climate and, and people and then bring in sort of in this inner circle you see like these different ways in which we pursue like specific factors that we might pursue like the geochemistry of the environment, uh, the hydrogeology of the environment or even the practices in which we, you know, manage water, manage ecosystems. Um, and, you know, keeping in mind that we are not there to appropriate this knowledge, but actually co-produce knowledge with our, with our partners. And it's, I, I say that, but it's actually, it's challenging to do that. I, you know, this is our goal. I, we like to think that we're working towards that. And I don't think we, I think anyone on our project would agree we aren't at a full capacity of co-production of knowledge, but we are always trying to honor that and trying to work towards that. Um, and I think, um, you know, we still have a ways to go, um, but we're, we're really genuinely working towards that. And so some of the things that, you know, we, we, we go out with our partners and do field work with them. And it's just this incredible, spiritual connection to the land that has been, you know, shared with us and in and, and how we think about our project and how we go forward. Um, you know, we I, I mentioned that we're very discipline focused as Western scientists. You know, I have specialties and I have strong limits, but our partners who teach us every day have a much more holistic understanding. And so that's what we're working towards. 
um, to bring in those those different systems. And so I'll, I'll kind of say that one of the biggest outcomes so far, I'm actually not going to go into the science so much, but one of the biggest outcomes so far has been this first paper. So this is a paper that we put together that sort of talks about this relationship building process and this accountability that we went through in order to get moving forward on, on the different aspects that our partners wanted. So this is a tr truly a tribally led project. We do not pursue science unless our partners tell us to pursue that science. So there's been things that people have brought up to us as like, well, why aren't you working on this? Why aren't you working on this? And, and we just step back and say, you know, if our, if our partners want us to work on that, we will work on that. And so this is, um, you can see all of the different um, people who've contributed, who've, who've agreed to contribute to this in a formal manner, this, this scientific publication. You can see the list of, of many different um, tribal members, um, tribes different being represented in this publication. And one of the major outcomes really was this research protocol. And we're, I think this is a really important step forward for academics at least in my discipline. I feel like, you know, Nancy has been leading this. This is, you know, she is at the forefront of, of how to do things ethically and responsibly and be accountable. But in the Western framework of science, we are often not, in academia, we are often not taught this. Um, I think that's changing with projects like ours, with a focus on educating future generations, we are changing this. Um, but some of the biggest mistakes we made have come out of developing this protocol, not, not going forward from the get-go with our partners, coming up with all these ideas and saying, Nancy, will you sign, will you, will you represent you know, Fond du Lac and sign this proposal and, and say, write a letter of support for our proposal because we're going to somehow help you know, the process. And so it's been a very humbling experience to step back and say, wow, this whole time I really, I really thought that like my science was going to help communities, was going to help society. I've always been working towards that goal because it's like deeply ingrained in me that that's what I want to do with my science. But it took sort of this project and being told <laughs> and realizing truly the mistakes we made about going forward um, in that, you know, we had to actually co-produce these proposals from the very get, these ideas from the very get-go. We had to spend more time listening. We had to go through formal processes of memorandums of understanding to do this science in the first place. Who owns the data? It turns out in academia, it's hard to give ownership of our data to our tribal partners, but we can do it. You have to go through a lot of steps, <laughs> turns out with lawyers, <laughs> but you can do it. And so, you know, everything we've learned from this, you know, goes, it, sulfate, definitely so important, right? We're, we are, we still think about sulfate. We still work on that, um, especially because, you know, it, it's, uh, it's actually, I think, going to be a bigger problem going forward than people are even realizing. So, of course, we all think of, you know, the issues with mining. But there's some new studies coming out that show that sulfate is increasing due to things like fertilizers. Um, a lot of our fertilizer, plant fertilizers right now, are really enriched in elemental selenium. That selenium gets oxidized, transformed to sulfate, and runs off into streams and waters. There's a lot of studies going on right now about what's going to happen with increased sulfur loading due to fertilizers. Other areas of human activities, burning of coal, you know, processing energy, en anything involving really energy intensive processes. If you look at the wastewater from, from, those from, from all that processing, it's very enriched in sulfate. So, you know, this isn't a problem that's unique to, you know, northeastern Minnesota. This is a problem that we should all be thinking about when we're thinking about wild rice. But we also want to think about 
water levels and climate change and you know aquatic invasive species and all of the other how we manage our own land and and um, you know the relationships that we have with land. Um, so that's you know where we're going with this project. We're working, you know, we're we're really led by what our partners want us to to work on, um, and I think that's one of the unique and aspects of this project, um, and something that has really, really, I think, shaped sort of many of us who were trained in the Western science perspective, um, and really, you know, it's not even just this project, it's how I pursue my science with other communities at this point. Um, so it's had a pretty profound impact on me personally, that's my story, um, and I'm really happy to share it with you. So. Well, thank you. I think we're learning a lot about how to approach sulfate, both in terms of the holistic approach to nature and the collaborative approach to community, and not always assuming that our Western traditions are the only answer. And I'd like to introduce now Dr. Jen Pearson. And uh, Dr. Pearson is a professor at the University of Minnesota Duluth Department of Family Medicine and Biobehavioral Health. And there are a lot of these wonderful cre credentials having to do with work at the university or on hormone and reproductive medicine. And I know Jen because she has been working using her, not only her knowledge as a doctor, but her role in the community of doctors to bring to our attention how sulfate and how anthropogenic activities, including sulfide mining, really affect human health as well as affecting our ability to be restored by the quality of water and the quality of wilderness. And so um, I'm going to let Jen talk now. This is really important because Nancy mentioned that sulfate can also increase mercury release and methylmercury, but the connection between what we do Anthropogenic activities, including coal burning as well, uh, and I didn't even know about the fertilizer, but what we do in our industrialized economy can, in fact, have a very significant negative impact on our own health. And sulfate is an important part of that puzzle. So go ahead, Jen. Yeah, thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? I'm kind of a wanderer when I talk, so I'll try to stay. Paula told me I had to stay on the camera. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and a, and a thank you to uh, for the invitation to be here. And I'm used to speaking in this space to medical students, and there are a few medical students, but I know they like a 50-minute break. So if you need to like go to the back and do jumping jacks or something, because we've kept you too long, I, I get that. But um, I'm going to, you know, the, the title of tonight's topic, Why Should Minnesota care about sulfate, the lens that I hope to bring to this is one of more the human health lens, right? Why do people like me or other healthcare providers care about this topic? And so I want to start with really a 30,000 foot view. And we weren't supposed to talk a lot about mining, but I want to mention this because for me, and I think for a lot of healthcare providers, when we started reading headlines about sulfide or copper nickel mining that started 10, 12, 14 years ago as a lot of these companies started looking at the Duluth complex in northern Minnesota, we started looking into this. And you don't have to scratch the surface too far to realize that sulfide or copper nickel mining is a very, very different type of mining than our traditional taconite mining in northern Minnesota. And so we started as healthcare providers to scratch our heads, get concerned, and coalesce. And I could talk for two hours on the subject, but I'm going to suffice it to say right now that what I want you to understand just as we head into this topic is that when we look at sulfide or copper nickel mining, we know that when we look at the World Health Organization's 10 worth, worst bad actors when it comes to major public health concerns, we know this type of mining releases six of these, mercury, lead, arsenic, asbestos, particulate air pollution, and cadmium. And so in addition to these heavy metal toxins, 
heavy metal and other toxins. The second bullet, po bullet point, this type of mining also releases sulfates. And I'm going to come back to this bullet point. Um, but we know also this third bullet point, and many of you in the room probably know this, but sulfate or copper nickel mining has a terrible track record, and especially in water-rich climates. So the least environmentally Toxic effects happen in the high desert of Chile or other places where there's no water. So when you do this kind of mining in a water-rich place, when you extract sulfide ore and you mix it with the atmosphere and water, you get sulfide uh, toxic acid mine drainage that has these heavy metals and that has sulfates in it. And we also know, to my last bullet point, that once we extract this, once we open the door to this kind of mining, we can never go back. This, this, will, be leach, this will be leachate that will happen for centuries. So this really is the backdrop where I want to focus mostly with the time I have tonight on this second bullet point, the fact that this type of mining releases sulfates, which we're going to talk about sulfates and mercury and the connection there. So this is my slide that I'm going to walk you through. But before I kind of launch into this slide, I want to talk for a moment about mercury, which probably brings us all back to high school chemistry, right? We all know mercury is on the periodic chart. We all know it's an element. We know that it's found in the environment. But what we also know is that mercury, from anthropogenic sources, we are polluting our environment with mercury, right? And it's from a lot of different sources, like my, you know, like my colleagues have already mentioned. We're talking smokestacks. We're talking burning fossil fuels. We're talking burning medical waste. So mercury comes from a lot of different places and often carries through the atmosphere and settles into our environment. So we have mercury here, period. But what happens... When you take the environment since the Industrial Revolution that we've now kind of fueled things like mercury into, and you release, and really Nancy and Kara both spoke to this, you release sulfate into this environment, and it stimulates the microorganisms in the environment, not only to do to wild rice what's, what's been discussed, but what it also does is it methylates the mercury that's already in the environment. So sulfide or copper nickel mining releases more mercury, yes, but there's already mercury there that it creates. You go from this elemental form of mercury to the toxic form, which is methylmercury. And so this enhanced rate of mercury methylation occurs. And methylmercury is what bioaccumulates in aquatic ecosystems. And I'm going to speak to this more. I've got a couple more slides that will, will kind of further this slide. And then we talk about how these concerns really meet human health, right? Because we're drinking the water, we're eating the fish, we're eating the, the food sources higher on the food chain, et cetera, where methylmercury accumulates. So... I want to just, and this has already been talked about, so I'm going to touch on this lightly, the, important of, the importance of wetlands. Wetlands are so important for so many reasons we can't get into tonight. But this, these are the places where when we have this elemental mercury, and, and like was already referred to, Nancy and Kara both talked about this, we have low sulfate wetlands, and we we let this leachate come in and we trigger this mercury methylation that then releases not only more mercury into the water, but the toxic form of mercury, which is methylmercury. And we know this is just the quick, kind of the quick and easy slide. We've probably all heard of bioaccumulation and biomagnification, right? So it not only releases this into the water, so if we're, you know, drinking water out of the Boundary Waters lakes or wherever it is, yes, but much more exponentially into those places where it accumulates. And methylmercury as a predilection for accumulating in fatty tissues, so brain. Uh, and our fish, our fish sources in these places are fatty fish, like northern, like walleyes, like bass. So it, that, that methylmercury tends to accumulate in those fatty fishes. And then we as humans um, eat those, right? So, and, and, or other animals eat those fish, and we eat those other animals. So this is the idea. Bioaccumulation is 
how those heavy metals uh, and methylmercury accumulate in these sources. And biomagnification, meaning the higher up the food chain we're eating, the more we get exposed to. So exponentially more, the higher you get up the food chain. So as a physician, why do I care about this? It's because of this. So when we talk about heavy metals, when we talk about methylmercury, sure, we're all at risk, but those most at risk are developing fetuses and our young children. And it's mul for multiple reasons, because um, when, a, when a woman is pregnant, uh, there is not, the, the placenta does not filter out all of this. And so there is actually an ability to reach the developing fetus. The blood-brain barrier in, in a young child also is not impermeable to heavy metals and methylmercury. And so, again, these have affinities for those fatty types of places, which are our brains. And so these tend to be the places that are heart most affected by things like methylmercury. So, yes, it can affect us all, but these are the most vulnerable populations. And so... Human health effects of methylmercury, and I, I could go off in a lot of dis different tangents on this slide. I think we know in medicine that there are really bad actors as far as human health effects of some of these toxins. And we know that our medical literature is starting to point more and more clearly to some of these anthropogenic causes, these things that we're doing to our environment, right? I think it makes sense logically that we just can't continue to do things to our, you know, our surroundings, our water, our planet, without it affecting human health. And so this is one study um, that was a great study. It's out of The Lancet, which is a very well-revered medical journal. But it really does that. It talks about how some of these environmental toxins, methylmercury being one of the worst actors, we, we are pointing fingers at, at, at things like methylmercury as far as why we're seeing a rise in things like ADD, or learning disorders, or autism spectrum disorders, or cognitive disabilities. Um, and so we talk about these neurodevelopmental disorders and why we're seeing this on the rise, and we can't separate that from some of the things that we are doing to our environment and how this can affect um, brain development, et cetera. So a few key points. I was told to be brief, so I'm trying to be brief. Um, Yes, methylmercury is a bad actor. This does not do good things in, in humans. Um, bullet point number two, that methylmercury exposure can occur by eating fish and other food sources that are contaminated by, by, via that bioaccumulation and biomagnification within the food chain. Um, bullet three, developing human brains are more susceptible to these bad actors, right? So we have to protect our little ones. Um, the fourth bullet point I haven't mentioned yet, but this is a study that was done by the Minnesota Department of Health back in 2011. Uh, it concluded, and it, what it did is it looked at the Lake Superior watershed and, and measured, it, you know, newborn babies go through newborn screening, right? And they measured the level of mercury that were all, that are, that's already here in our babies being born in this region. And one out of 10 babies in this area of Minnesota already have higher than higher than desired, than EPA recommended levels of mercury. And so this is already a problem. And so the concern is if we don't, if we don't regulate toxic industry that is putting more into our environment, we are adding to the already existent burden. Um, this bullet point, neurotoxic, I'm, what is it? Number five, neurotoxic damage from methylmercury can have significant impacts on individuals in society. And this, this bullet point, I actually just want to say a word. I've worked with a lot of physicians on these issues, and our child and adolescent psychiatrists have been very vocal about this, right? Because when we talk about neurodevelopmental disorders, these are things you can't treat. You can't change. That they, they happen, and then you deal with that for the remainder of the lifespan. And so there's a cost to society that comes, right? with these kinds of problems. And 
Last bullet point, and really this is what we've been talking about the whole time. These health impacts are often disproportionate and affecting people who are consuming local fish, uh, menomen, other things at higher rates. So this, so this becomes, you know, those who rely on subsistence fishing, et cetera, this becomes a, 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 an, a justice issue that we need to be aware of. So I want to let you know I am not alone in my concern as a, as a physician. Um, when these headlines started to come in our local papers uh, about sulfide or copper nickel mining, and we started to kind of coalesce around this issue, and we started to attend public comment periods and comment on environmental impact statements, et cetera, these are the um, bodies of physicians and other public health uh, allies that have weighed in. We've had the voices that represent tens of thousands of health practitioners in our state weigh in on these issues over the past 10 to 12 years. And so um, there's been a significant crescendo to say, and, and really the consistent ask that has occurred is to say, look, we need a regulatory, a, a regulatory um, process that makes sure that we are including human health as part of this environmental impact. And so there are tools that exist, environmental uh, risk assessment, uh, envir or excuse me, health impact assessment. We need these mandated when we're looking at, at toxic industry in a water-rich place like we live. Um, and my last bullet point, as of now, these have not been done. So. Mm -hmm. This is just to let you know, this is uh, myself along with some of my medical colleagues have published some articles and put these into the, into the medical literature about this topic that we're talking about tonight. So if you want more details about this, these are three articles out there. I would also encourage you to look at the reference list. There's a lot of basic science. There's a lot of regulatory data. There's a lot of studies on sulfide or copper nickel mining that, that we include in the reference list. But um, I don't have time to delve into those. So what can we each do, right? I look in the mirror and ask myself that every day. Um, we educate ourselves about this topic, right? We continue to pressure our lawmakers and our regulatory agencies to mandate that human health be rigorously considered and studied before we permit toxic industries. And, and like my colleagues have already said, it's not just sulfide or copper nickel mining. There are a lot of things that can contribute to these anthropogenic um, insults. How do we begin to connect to the silos that have separated human health from what we're doing to our environment and just be smart and try to keep ourselves and our future generations safe and healthy. And last but not least, support our key local organizations that are fighting hard for our clean water. So it's with that, thank you for being here. Um, and I'm gonna hand it back over to Paula. I'm going to stand up because my knees are really unhappy sitting this long. Um, I think we want to recap what our wonderful panelists, let's give them one more round of applause. <laughs> what we've been talking about, starting with Ricky's introduction, is the difference between just moving forward with consumption and production and taking into consideration what we need for life all the way through to Jen's discussion about how our industries are actually affecting human life, the most fundamental ways in terms of the brains of our developing fetuses and infants and children. And I want to give some ideas of what you can do to help. First, learn as much as you can. And this is a good start, but there are going to be opportunities. If you're in the university community, ask your professors to bring in someone to talk about what is happening in terms of an industry, in northern Minnesota and how it's affecting the water and the rice and the fish. And maybe if you're in a, not in a science area but more policy or humanitarian, see if you can get someone to come in and talk about the importance of looking at the world from a different cosmological perspective where we are not at the very top but we're in a community that involves plants and animals and water and the living spirits in all things. And that is going to be a way of just bringing in another viewpoint, maybe not to proselytize and change, but to see that it's, there's a possibility we could do things differently, maybe to help generations to come. 
And there's some very specific things. I mean, you have legislative. We don't do lobbying, but you have great a great legislator in in your representing Duluth who is trying to do things to protect the environment. Even if you're not a big money contributor, a call saying, I'm listening to you, I'm watching, and I appreciate where you, what you're doing is a really big deal. So even small things, you know, showing up, helping to volunteer, you can sign up for Water Legacy. But there's some really concrete things. Um, there's Eric Morrison is here. Um, the tribes have been doing sampling for sulfate, and some citizens groups have started doing that also to make sure that we identify all the waters that have already been harmed by industry, whether it's mining or coal burning, and list them as impaired. Because what Nancy was saying, remember that if we could stop the sulfate pollution, if we could make the industries treat their wastewater rather than just dumping the sulfate, that we'd give a chance for those ecosystems to recover. And so after we're all done today, Eric, can you wave your hand? Um, Eric is a volunteer, he's a chemist, and he's organized efforts to do testing of sulfate in the water. And we maybe a lot of the waters that are on the boundary waters, because of coal mining pollution going in that direction, have been impaired for sulfate. And the tribes have been doing this for years, but in the last couple years, there have been several citizen groups, often citizen volunteers, who've been helping out to try and get the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency to recognize the science, list the waters that are impaired for sulfate, and then move forward and limit the sulfate and protect them. And there's similarly, there have been members of the community, um, you know, members of the community from Duluth going back, oh, I don't know, 15 years, who've been trying to get the state of Minnesota to limit the pollution, both mercury pollution and sulfate pollution, that makes the St. Louis River impaired for mercury. And they're going to be, unfortunately, we have not been able to get that door open for the community to play as active a role as they did before in this issue. But if you hear anything about a mercury TMDL, total maximum daily load study, anything at all, your participation is going to be really important to make sure that it's not just the industry and the agencies talking together in a room, but that they hear from the community that we want to reduce the harm to fetuses, infants, and children in our families and in the families to come from toxic mercury contamination. And I think the most important thing is, I think this goes back to what Ricky was saying. This tends to be a pretty closed system, most of the decision making. And it's a system that is there to perpetuate anthropogenic wealth creation rather than preservation of nature. And I think Nancy said it a little differently that a lot of what she's been working on and I think what Water Legacy has been working on too is trying to level the playing field. And the more people, and that includes professors and students and scientists and leaders in the community, the more people who are trying to get on the playing field in any way they can and support those of us who have put in real, real time on that, on that struggle, the more likely we are to at least crack the door open a little bit and let in the, the light of life. So I'm done talking. Um, I would love to hear from you. Questions are good. I will repeat them so that um, just in case the mic doesn't pick them up adequately, or you could write them on a card and we can pick them up either way because I'd like, I'd like to hear what you're thinking. One question in the chat behind you. How do we contact Eric for sulfate testing? Eric, what's Eric? Um, are you passing around something? You want to stand up? Um, there was a question. How do we contact Eric Morrison if we want to participate in sulfate testing? Do you have a sign up list someplace that you could put on that table? Or I'll put a sign up list out. In, um Thank you. I'll put up a sign up list outside on the table here. Um, the way to get a hold of me is really easy. It's just info at nlsap.org. And we're um, just getting ready for the next year of water testing. And um, we're getting a lot of fresh faces in our group. And we're really expanding what we do. Um, 
I can talk a little bit more about it, but it's getting to be a lot, lot of fun because we're not just getting water from the usual places, but as Paula mentioned, this pollution is going to the boundary waters now. We're going to keep an eye on that, and that's great. We get to go to the boundary waters, and we also get to go to places in the boundary waters that's not on a path of pollution because um, people need to know what the environment looked like before people started putting roads in and mining. So I'll be out. I'll stick around as long as anybody's interested. And you know, Eric, if you could put a, a sign up list even on this table here, so as people walk out the door, um, there's a water legacy sign up list on the big table outside, but I think it's important to have a sign up. So if you feel that you have a chance, you'd like to go in actually sample for sulfate, um, I think Eric is going to be taking a crew of people and to the boundary waters and maybe also parts of the estuary around um, the St. The Louis River estuary as well this year, because those are some of the target areas that are very important to many communities that have been affected. Are there other questions? Okay. <coughs> oh, what does NILSAP stand for? Um, that stands for Northern Lakes Scientific Advisory Panel. This, this group kind of started out um, you know, answering questions for legislators. And, uh, you know, the comment was, so my state senator, Matt Klein, voted to uh, repeal the sulfate standard. He did it twice. He lives a block away from me. I asked him what was that all about. And he told me, well, I, I just really didn't know the science that would allow me to look labor in the eye and tell him why I didn't vote for what they asked for. And so the group was already present. It really started with um, some people from my church. And because there was this request to know the science, it became the Northern Lake Scientific Advisory Panel. So that's what you know, NILSAP, now it's called NILSAP. And just to follow up on the question of knowing the science, um, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency in 2011 put together an advisory committee to learn the science about sulfate and wild rice. And both Nancy and I served on that. And what we learned is that, and Nancy talked about some of John Pastor's, uh, Professor Pastor's research. What we learned is that the hypothesis that a naturalist had done from the 1920s to the 1940s, looking at the lakes and measuring them, the old fashioned kind of science, which is to get out in nature, was confirmed when we looked inside the tanks and looked inside the test tubes. And as a result, um, a, a Minnesota administrative law judge concluded that the science supported keeping the standard. And then the legislature said, we don't care about the science, we want to repeal the, the law anyhow. And there was a lot of organizing and Governor Dayton vetoed that bill twice, the, the attempt to get rid of the standard. And since then, with a lot of, um, tribal leadership, and a lot of work with the Environmental Protection Agency, the Environmental Protection Agency finally said, Minnesota, you haven't done your job. You've, you've refused to list any waters that have wild rice and sulfate as being impaired. And the first decision came down from the United States Environmental Protection Agency, and since then the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency um, has listed additional wild rice waters. And that's the effort that we're working on um, in the community as well as the tribes to make sure that the waters that are impaired are actually listed. So there's been, uh, at least on that front, there's been a lot of progress. Nancy, if you want to grab that, if you want to say something about that, go ahead. Well, I think you captured it pretty well. It took many, many years of commenting on um, these impaired waters lists, which come out every two years. I think uh, tribes first commented in 2010 about the failure of the MPCA to list known impaired wild rice waters. And we kept elevating our concerns to EPA each time that we commented. Finally, in 2020, EPA said, okay, enough. You've had a chance. We're going to take this part away from you, MPCA, and we are going to list 35 impaired wild rice waters, and that seemed to crack it open, so to speak. And so now MPCA is trying to figure out their sulfate standard implementation strategy. 
Yes. What happened last Wednesday down in St. Paul with the courts? Is there an update on that? Uh, there's a question what, what has been happening in the courts in St. Paul. And this past week from Monday to Friday, I was in a process, an administrative hearing contested case process, which is a lot like a court. And this is the first time there's been a contested case hearing on any mining project since the reserve mining project in the 1970s. And what we were talking about with experts is, is the plan for the Polymet project, is the cover that they plan to put over the tailings waste and reclamation inadequate or adequate? And if it's inadequate, what it will mean is that there would be water and air seeping through the tailings that are reactive and have sulfate. And the science today says that if you use the kind of cover they want to, they still want to use in, until we have a decision, which is soil and a little clay mixed in, that within a period of anywhere from five to 20 years, they will, those kind of covers will deteriorate. And it will be just as if you had nothing there except dirt, earth. And so that, that information was gathered this past week. And then the lawyers on both sides, Polymet and DNR, and then a, a group of us, the Fond du Lac Band and a, couple, and a bunch of groups of environmentalists, we're gonna put together um, findings of fact and briefs and then the administrative law judge will read that and make his recommendation. And then the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources will look at that recommendation and make their own. And this is a real, this is a very good example is that in this process, this is an attempt to level the playing field, but I will tell you it's a very difficult process. And the agency, the state agency tends to be in charge in, in terms of what issues get raised and changing the rules of the game in, in the middle of the hearing. So I'm hoping that because of the experts were so strong that we'll have a requirement that Polymet reconsider its plans on reclamation and using this soil, this tailings bentonite combination. But we won't know for several months what the actual decisions are. Other questions, comments, thoughts? Well, we have a question in the okay. chat for Nancy. What does SRB stand for? <laughs> Sulfate reducing bacteria. It's a, there's probably hundreds if not thousands of species that use sulfate as, a, as an energy, energy source. Yeah. And, and, and just to make me, you know, I'm going to say, I, I want to say this with the chemist in the room. When you first think, read that, you think that this, the bacteria are getting rid of the sulfate. And what they're really doing it is changing its form so then it becomes sulfide. So it's not like, it's not like these bacteria are the heroes. It's that these bacteria are the facilitators of some of the processes that are most inimical to wild rice and most likely to result in um, release of mercury from sediments and mercury methylation. And um, just a footnote on mercury methylation, this bioaccumulation that um, Jen was talking about, Jen Pearson, it can be as much as a million times more concentration of methyl mercury in fish at the top of the food chain as compared to what's in the water. So this, the ability of methyl mercury to bioaccumulate versus elemental mercury, which does not, is a very significant factor, and that's why these SRB folks, they're not heroes. They're a, real, they're a really important part of the ecology that can have adverse consequences when human beings are adding parameters such as sulfate into the system. Do we, ha do we have any professors in this room? Yes. <laughs> 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 They're sitting in the back row, but I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that some of these topics that we're talking about today, that we and, and other folks like Nancy would have a chance to bring, and, and, and Jen would have a chance to bring them into the classroom and let more people know about how human activities are influencing our environment here. Are there any more questions? We have one from Kirk Dornfield. I'm going to read it. Many years ago, lead was found to be a threat to developing children. Any lessons from that issue and following 
legislation elimination that can help move the mercury and sulfate elimination forward. This is kind of a policy question, and America was very late in regulating lead. I mean, we allowed lead gasoline much longer than Europe did, and there were a number of studies that were done um, with, in lead with people who are incarcerated and found it a very disproportionate number of people who were incarcerated who had high le lead levels. And they replicated that, those studies, many of them with primates, and found the same inability to control behavior in primates so that it was a, it was a characteristic of lead. It wasn't a coincidence. With mercury, Minnesota's approach, which was actually very innovative, was it 20 years ago? I mean, I was involved with the initial mercury TMDL. And the idea was that we'd reduce the amount of mercury, elemental mercury, that goes into the air. And in some sectors, Minnesota has been very successful in reducing mercury going into the air. In the, it was the mining sector, and I worked on this when I was with the Sierra Club, um, 2001. The mining sector was almost like a, a third rail. And so that was one sector where the mercury in the air did not get cut back. But the, new, the science that we've learned more recently is it's not just the amount of elemental mercury that is stored in our sediments and stored in our wetlands as a result of burning coal and burning oil. It is also whether that elemental mercury gets changed into methyl mercury. And that's why the, the science we're talking about today, it's not enough to do what we did with the control of air emissions of methyl mercury, which was a really good positive step forward. It was good policy, but it's not enough. And Nancy knows even more about this. Go ahead. Yeah, it, it was a great idea. The statewide mercury TMDL that was approved by EPA in 2008 called for 90% reduction, 93% reduction in mercury air emissions from all sectors by 2025 over a 1990 baseline. And each sector, the electric power generating industry, refineries, mercury and products, the taconite industry, each sector had its reduction goals. Well, the mining, the taconite sector had a long time. They were given a lot of leeway to come up with their plans for how they were going to reduce mercury air emissions and then begin to implement it on each of their lines in their, in their processing plants. And when the deadline came for them to submit their mercury reduction plans, they all said, yeah, we can't afford it. The technology is just not there. Well, the fact is, there is technology. In the time that they have cried poverty that we can't afford it, they have been making hand over fist, record-breaking, record um, profits. What I heard today really kind of made my blood boil just a little because right now the mercury statewide mercury TMDL is not an enforceable instrument. It's, it is essentially voluntary unless there is underlying statutory framework or regulations to require it to happen. In the case of the electric power generating industry, the statewide TMDL was followed very quickly by statewide and federal regs on, on emission reductions. Taconite is such a unique esoteric uh, phenomenon that is not widely known or understood. They've managed to escape that until about 10 years ago when EPA was under a consent decree to develop federal standards for the taconite sector. And then under the previous administration, they let that languish. Under the current administration, they have taken that back up again. We expect to see federal taconite mercury emissions regulations by the end of this calendar year. But in the meantime, the MPCA has put forward a proposal that one of the ways that we could deal with this extraordinary budgetary surplus that we're enjoying right now is to provide grants to the taconite industry to help defray those costs of installing and implementing mercury emissions control technology. So there's, there's kind of the science and the policy and the politics all wrapped up in one issue. 
I want to see those emissions reduced in my lifetime, but it burns me to no end to think that we're going to help pay for it. Again, still, in other ways. Yes, go ahead. Since Nancy was kind enough to create an opening on the subject of taconite, I just can't help pointing out that you support everything I've heard today and learned a lot. But there is also an existing problem in the taconite <coughs> region from the mine pit lakes that are left behind when mining stops. When you stop taconite mining, you expose fool's gold, let's say, <laughs> to the elements. And, and I know Kara can tell the whole chapter and verse on this. But there are ways in which you can reduce the existing increasing concentrations of sulfate in mine pit lakes th across the range. We need some advice and direction from Nancy, but we have, we've been working on this for years. Do we have a way of forcing the sulfate reducing bacteria, those little criminals we talked about, <laughs> uh, to uh, eat or use the sulfate as energy? And in turn, we have a process that takes the product of that and help yields at the end uh, elemental sulfur, essentially, that could be used for fertilizer. So, so we'll, we'll talk more about that. This is not a subject for today. But while we're all focused on sulfide mining, let's keep in mind for years and years we've been producing sulfate in mine pit lakes, including many that are providing the water for the cities that, along the range. Well, I don't know if everybody heard that, but the, basically the issue of sulfate is not only the brand new copper nickel mining, which hasn't yet been permitted, but the existing taconite industry. And um, the, when we were talking before, and, and Eric Morrison was talking about doing the sampling, some of the places that have had high sulfate that has impaired the wild rice, like Birch Lake, the sources are from existing taconite mines. And the tribes have been documenting for decades um, in relationship to the U.S. Steel Mintac tailings basin, that that tailings basin is releasing sulfate that is impairing wild rice, and the pollution is also increasing mercury methylation of fish going d um, downstream from that. So I think from Water Legacy's perspective, that is a very, um, it might be a politically tricky issue, but chemistry doesn't really care about politics. And we're concerned about controlling sulfate releases whether it's from one source of, or another, it doesn't matter because it, sulfate is the same chemical. And so we have been involved with um, a per, a litigation, a permit appeal that had to do with the Mintac tailings basin. We, I mean, Water Legacy, but also the Fond du Lac band, um, in order to uh, require that there be controls of that sulfate rather than simply letting it seep through the ground and up into the watershed. So that's, I think that it is important that the sulfate, it's a matter of chemistry. It's not really a matter of politics. It doesn't care what political party or what kind of a facility it is. The same chemical could have really adverse effects on the water system. Want to add anything? Yeah, I can just add a little bit about some of the science that we're doing in relationship to studying those old systems. And um, one of the interesting things that we're learning right now is that as the sulfate moves into the sediment and gets transformed, reduced to sulfide, um, there is a lot more that happens with that sulfur than we actually anticipated. And so we've been using some techniques recently to look at what are the sulfur fractions, because it's not just sulfide and it's not just sulfate. There's a whole host of chemical compounds in between those two sort of like extremes. Um, and what we're finding is that there's a lot of elemental sulfur, there's a lot of um, organosulfur compounds, and what we don't know yet is are those truly a sink for sulfur or could they eventually be another source to produce more sulfate? And so uh, we've shown through some, some of our work um, looking at the biogeochemistry and the hydrology is that when you have fluctuating water levels, which are normal, but then are going to be exasperated with, due to climate change, you can actually regenerate sulfate in the subsurface. So it's not just like it stays sulfide, it gets transformed to elemental sulfur, to other elements, and then generates more sulfate 
in the subsurface, which then can get reduced. So it just like cycles really fast, round and round, um, rather than just sort of this linear process. And so we're actually doing a lot of work to, to interrogate what's actually happening sort of on a, a biogeochemistry level related to the hydrology. I also think, I also makes me think about when hearing about the, the um, boundary waters, because the boundary waters are an area where yes, they might be getting external you know, inputs of sulfur from coal mining and, and other you know, airborne sources. But I also wonder about all the sulfur that was stored when it, as it was soaked up basically at times where we had a lot more acid rain, right? So back many years ago, before we took care of acid rain problems, that acid rain was sulfuric acid, right? And so all that sulfur at one point accumulated in the boundary, everywhere, right? And, and then in sensitive areas like the boundary waters, it is curious to me whether or not we also have remobilization of some of that sulfur from that's been basically stored in those soils and wetlands in the in the um, in the boundary waters areas, um, and then due to climate change and other factors, kind of remobilizing a lot of that sulfur. So I, I do question. So some of the things we're learning right now by studying those older systems um, might. I am curious as to whether or not they might be happening up in the boundary waters. So. Um. There are a couple more questions. Um, this one, um, does the right of nature of wild rice help to inform the case against copper, nickel, sulfate, sulfide ore mining? I'm going to give you the narrow legal um, case and then the important case uh, either Nancy or Ricky can talk to. The narrow legal case is that in other countries and other places, the rights of nature have been recognized. Uh, we do not have any history of recognizing the rights of nature in Minnesota. We actually have a very difficult time even recognizing the rights of people in connection with um, industrial efforts. So I think it's very important to legislate the rights of nature because it begins to change the discussion because it suggests that there's somebody other than the entity that's seeking a permit that has rights, but it is not a short-term legal solution. It is a moral solution. You want to say anything about that, Ricky or Nancy? It seems globally that the rights of robots will happen before the rights of nature. <laughs> um, other nations are pushing for that right. Um, I think that that, again, is where some victories could be taking place that we can join in on. The estuary here, the the Great Sea of the Ojibwe, the um, Lake Superior, other waterways, um, this is where the fight's at. So we've got to um, step up and fight or join those or stand next to those ones that are fighting. I think that if... These organized criminals that I'm going to go out on a limb and say that if they're left unchecked and unchallenged um, at this time, at this moment, um, it could be irreversible for our children that are coming. The <clears throat> if they in in front of us pillage the coffers of the state of Minnesota under the guise that they're looking out for our wellness. This form of the, the profit seekers, the profiteers and their decadent lifestyles filled with debauchery and driven by avarice is going to be, is, is completely un unsustainable and we can't allow that to happen. So that's why, you know, I'm, I'm grateful to be amongst the people that care. So um, we have a lot of work to do, and I think rights of nature will be one avenue that we can do, and we work at a concerted effort um, from many different angles, and that's a, really a, a one that looks good for the future. And I think we have time for just that one last question, which is the switch to 
um, from fossil fuels to renewable energy, will, re will it require massive um, quantities of mining, and particularly including copper and nickel? And I think that um, from Water Legacy's perspective, we don't know whether the nickel and copper in the Northeast Minnesota will actually be needed. We know there's a huge potential for recycling and reuse of copper. And we have, you know, Jen McEwen introduced a bill to require recycling of copper and recycling of electronics in Minnesota. And I think that bill never even got a hearing. So the, the, there are, and the economy of recycling and reuse creates local jobs, local profits, and copper can be reused almost inf indefinitely, over and over. So I think there's a real push to go to the kind of solution that is the most centralized, that benefits the fewest people, and in this case, benefits the profits of multinational corporations. Also, at least as I read the paper, they're not trying to actually reduce the use of fossil fuels. And, and, and scale back the demand, but rather bigger and bigger and bigger, because we're continuing now to be, uh, at the federal level, allowing offshore drilling, allowing drilling in very vulnerable areas. So I think if someone is telling you that this is part of a really coherent strategy towards sustainability, I don't see that. And we do a lot of research and have a lot of experts who are saying, there's a huge push towards mining, but there isn't a huge push to actually reduce the consumption of oil or gas. The other thing, I think that if anyone can tell you today and assures you that the kind of transition we need is lithium nickel batteries, that they, you know, whatever they say, you should get out the, the cards that, and, and read their palm and have them tell you who, who, what your children are gonna do when they grow up. Because no one knows what the transitional fuel is going to be, whether it's going to be hydrogen, whether it's going to be lithium ion batteries, or whether it's going to be a, a battery that is developed specifically unlike the current lithium nickel batteries, so it doesn't explode easily and doesn't create fires that can't be put out. I don't know the answer, I don't, and so, but what we all do know is that no matter what, we need clean water, not just as human beings, not just as wild rice, not need, just as fish, but for all life. So I, from my perspective, we know that the one commodity that we all rely on for life is endangered. And we know that the other metals that corporations want to extract and take from Minnesota soil may or may not actually be necessary and there is no coherent strategy to use them in a way that will be sustainable and will protect us and will protect our water. So that's my answer to that. Um, if, if any of the panelists want to make a quick response and then we'll be here for a few more minutes. Um, thank you so much for coming and we're very grateful. Don't clap now because I want to hear Nancy. <laughs> just, just one caution about that argument, which is really popular right now amongst uh, promoters of mine development in this area. Let's mine here where we know how to do it responsibly. I'm looking at an emerging project for Talon Metals out in Tamarack yes. that has changed and has morphed um, a number of times. They have tried to um, demonstrate uh, need for their product by a, a really splashly Flashy uh, announcement about a, a long-term contract with Tesla to provide nickel for their uh, for their batteries. They've changed their project concept a number of times, um, but most recently, because I think they see the resistance and the difficulties in going through environmental review and permitting around water quality issues here in Minnesota so much that they are proposing that their clean metal project is just going to dig up the ore here in Minnesota using underground mining techniques, and then they are going to ship it up to North Dakota for processing. Yeah. 
So that's the kind of scenario that I ask you to keep in mind when somebody is leveling an argument about uh, climate change and the importance of these metals for us to be able to improve our, our energy portfolio. I don't buy any argument that there's anything sustainable about that approach to mining in Minnesota. Well, and if anyone is down in the Twin Cities or in Stillwater, we're going to start talking. Um, Water Legacy has a couple events there to talk about the Talon Mine Project. And both the Fond du Lac Band and the Black Band are very involved in trying to make sure that this equation is not only about metal, it's about water. And um, I think the, the Milax Band actually talks about their effort as water over, over nickel. So I, I, think, I thank you so much for raising this issue. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your patience. I am very grateful for everybody who came here. And please contact, please sign up if you'd like to help um, Eric Morrison with the monitoring. And please sign up with, if you'd want to be informed of opportunities to get involved to protect water and community and wild rice and fish. Um, water Legacy sign up is right outside. Thank you so much. <laughs>